this is going to be the biggest uh, controversy in the history of the United States. They treated me so well, uh, but all that changed in 2016 when Donald Trump won the election. And what I realized was, oh my God, some of these news items really did happen. The media wasn't willing to talk about this counter evidence that existed. They control everything. They read our emails, they read our location data, they sell it to intelligence agencies around the world. But the problem that we're facing right now is I found what that project was. That project was called Hey everybody, we have an awesome show lined up with our special guest, Zach Voorhees, who is the whistleblower that came up came out on Project Veritas not too long ago exposing what Google is doing. Zach, thank you so much for being with us on Edge of Wonder and taking time out of your already busy schedule. We know you're interviewing everywhere, so thanks a lot for being here. Thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be on the program. So Zach, let's just like kind of jump right into it. What made you decide to really come out and do this? Because I mean, obviously, now that you're kind of exposed, I mean, your whole life has changed. So why don't you explain a little bit about what's going on and how and why you decided to come out? Yeah, so I've worked for Google for eight and a half years. I started off with the Google Earth Project and then in 2013, I started working on one of the YouTube projects um, that was involved with taking YouTube and putting it on the game consoles and the TVs. I specifically was involved with the PS4, the Nintendo Switch and the Xbox version of uh, YouTube. Um, and, you know, everything was really great with the company. You know, the media has been talking really good about Google and how they take care of their employees. And let me tell you, all of that is true. They treated me so well. They gave me free lunches. They gave me free breakfast uh, and dinner massages on your birthday. Um, you got to work on a 20% project, even though they kind of scaled that back in the later years. Everything was great. And by the way, I was getting paid like a quarter million dollars a year to, you know, basically live at the company and um, do, you know, my coding magic. Uh, but all that changed in 2016 when Donald Trump won the election. Now, I've lived through a few disappointing, um, you know, presidential elections where the person that I, you know, wanted to win didn't win. Um, and my general philosophy is, well, that's just democracy, you know, uh, suck it up and try again in four years. And I assumed that that was what was going to happen in the unlikely event that Trump would won. But that didn't happen. The company kind of held like an emergency TGIF after Trump won. And oh my God, like this meeting was absolutely eye opening. And the reason why it was eye opening was because of the things that the C level executives were saying about the election. Sergey Brin said that the election was personally offending to him. Um, and the CEO or the CFO actually broke down in tears. Um, talking about how, you know, she was reminiscing about the night that Trump won and how she was emailing work coworkers and saying, it looks like we're going to lose this one. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? We're, we're going to lose this one. Like someone else is in power. Your guy didn't get in or your woman and try again next year. But no, 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 they were not, they were not acting like, well, you know, that's just the way it is. They were acting like this is a really bad situation and America's about to like go down the tubes. And what was really surprising to me was what the CEO Sundar Pichai said, in which he stated that the one of the big effective things that they were able to do during the election was to censor the fake news using some of their machine learning algorithms. And I went, fake news? What? We're censoring fake news? I thought that that we're, we're not censoring anything. Like, what's really weird is that the tech giants up to this point were refusing to give information about terrorists because they said that that would set a dangerous precedent. But here they're, they're talking about how they were censoring fake news, which I didn't even know was 
was something that we were doing at all. And so I just started researching because I was like, well, if they're censoring fake news, then there's someone deciding what fake news is. And, you know, Google was a pretty open company. They're not so much anymore. <laughs> but at the time, they were really, really open. So all of their design documents about this fake news suppression was readily available. And I, as a full time uh, employee, had access to their public internal documents. And so I just started researching. And I was like, what's fake news? How do they define it? Oh, here's a slide deck. And I went through this PowerPoint presentation and they're listing examples of fake news that hit the uh, Facebook trending section. And what I realized was, oh my God, some of these news items really did happen. Wait a minute, why are they, why are they using examples of news items that, that had happened? And let me give you an example of what they considered was fake news. They considered that Hillary Clinton running weapons to Benghazi in order to uh, arm ISIS terrorists was something that was fake news. And as someone that's been researching this stuff for a while, I went, no, 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 I think this actually happened. There's like a huge thing about it. There's piles of evidence that shows that Hillary Clinton did in fact run weapons to Benghazi to fund and arm ISIS terrorists in order to destabilize the country of Syria. Um, and so I was like, okay, something's wrong here. I need to like look in further um, because if they're now deciding that something that is real news is actually fake news, then there's got to be a mechanism downstream of that in order to filter it from the internet. I found what that project was. That project was called, get ready for this, Machine Learning Fairness. <laughs> Why? Fair. Like using those in the same phrase, just what is that? Yeah. So apparently, according to Google, the internet was inherently biased and racist and misogynist and that they, the self-appointed, you know, arbiters of freedom and peace and prosperity and equality of justice had elected themselves to be the people that would filter the internet. Oh, I was just going to say that that reminds me of like Mars attacks when they're coming, you know, they're like, we come in peace and they're like killing everybody. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So I was like, oh, no, this is going to get bad. And I went, Why are they doing this all for Trump? Like this seems like a like kind of an overreaction because they didn't yeah. get the guy that they wanted or the woman in the presidency. And the thing is, is that they're making like a huge deal out of Hillary Clinton not winning the presidency. Like, okay, like I get it if like you had some really great person that you wanted to win and they didn't. But Hillary Clinton, are you kidding me? You know, this is the weirdest circus about this whole thing is that Hillary Clinton was the reason why they were upset, you know? Wow. So um, <laughs> the fake news started happening immediately when oh. Trump was inaugurated. I remember that Trump had a record crowd for his inauguration day, but then the newspapers were all sending and sharing like images of what looked like to be a totally empty uh, field in front of the president. And they said, oh my God, he's a liar, look at this. Now I've been to an inauguration. I was in Barack Obama's inauguration in 2008, okay? I know- Yeah, so was I, Zach. I was there too. Well, I was at Trump's actually. Yeah, yeah. You, can, I was, you were there I yourself. Was, you know yeah. that it was crowded, right? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And because what I think what happened was they took the photo before he went on. It was like everyone was still gathering. It was at and 8 so a.m. Yeah. So the the photo wasn't a complete photo. It was it a complete photo? They took it early in the morning. You could tell because everything looks really frigid, cold, and there's no sun out. And the thing is, is that everyone is crowded near the entrance of the gates. And mm -hmm. what that told me was that they had just opened the entrance, people were flooding in, they were still, you know, um, concentrated on one side and they had it dispersed. So on day one, um, the media is colluding uh, with themselves in order to broadcast a fake, um, a fake version of reality. And later, Sean Spicer had a, hel uh, a press conference and he says, well, no, we stand by the statement that this was the largest inauguration, we got those numbers from the number of people that entered into the subway system. Photographs of the inaugural proceedings were intentionally framed in a way, in one particular tweet, to minimize the enormous support that had gathered on the National Mall. This was the first time 
in our nation's history that floor coverings have been used to protect the grass in the mall. That had the effect of highlighting any areas where people were not standing, while in years past, the grass eliminated this visual. This was also the first time that fencing and magnetometers went as far back on the wall, preventing hundreds of thousands of people from being able to access the mall as quickly as they had in inaugurations past. Inaccurate numbers involving crowd size were also tweeted. No one had numbers because the National Park Service, which controls the National Mall, does not put any out. By the way, this applies to any attempts to try to count the number of protesters today in the same fashion. We do know a few things, so let's go through the facts. We know that from the platform where the president was sworn into 4th Street holds about 250,000 people. From 4th Street to the media tent is about another 220,000. And from the media tent to the Washington Monument, another, another 250,000 people. All of this space was full when the president took the oath of office. We know that 420,000 people used the DC Metro public transit yesterday which actually compares to 317,000 that used it for President Obama's last inaugural. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. And I went, okay, well, this is, this is really weird. And then the Russian collusion hoax started coming in. And the thing was, is that there was so much investigative work that was conclusively showing that the story that was being presented by the media that the Russians hacked into the DNC was um, had a bunch of contradictions and holes in it. But despite all this evidence, the media wasn't willing to talk about this counter evidence that existed. And so for right from the get go, I'm like, wow, there really is this collusion. These people that have been talking about this collusion conspiracy with the media, um, it looks like their model of reality is really, really explaining what's happening here. It was predictive. And that's how you know what a good model is, is that it's predictive. And so, um, you know, this is what really motivated me because I was like, well, if the media is colluding on this and then Google's part of this collusion, then there's some controller above the CEO level that's controlling this company. And, uh, and so I started, you know, that's, that's kind of like what started this whole thing. Um, I found out that their, that their censorship regime was called machine learning fairness. And it kind of makes sense that they would call it something like that. Like, you know, Project Dragonfly, which I've been stating a lot, was a fake uh, censorship engine. And the reason why I believe it was fake was because one, there's no information that I could ever find on it within Google's internal systems. And two, why would Google ever name something that censored the internet after a predator insect? Okay, like if I wanted to, you know, name something that I would, you know, sneak into the entire internet infrastructure, I wouldn't call it effing Velociraptor. I would call it something like the Fair and Equal Equalness Initiative, right? Because how could you be against fairness and equalness, right? Like that. Like it, it's built into the word itself to be um, to be good, and we we have like a positive association with it. So this whole machine learning fairness like clicked in. I was like, okay, this matches the pattern of language that I've seen. You know, one of my backgrounds is in psychology and mathematics and computer science, so I'm kind of like a little bit more sensitive to manipulations and propaganda. And like right away, I was like, this is. This is it, this is what's going on. And I started digging and digging and digging who's involved with it, who's making it, who you know, who thought this up. Um, the answer to that is that it was thought up in Stanford. It had been on a slow simmer for a while and then kind of got adopted into Google and then they sort started like rolling it out as fast as they could. And so the rollout started to happen in 2017. And they they didn't really try to hide it from the, from the, the company. They kind of mentioned it a few times, and if you're a curious cat like myself, you could find out the whole the whole system. But they didn't really try to hide it at all, which is part of the magic that they do. If they just sort of roll it out and they tell you that they're rolling it out and no one's objecting to it, then people are like, well, I guess it's just okay then, right? I guess this whole censorship engine is great, and if I complain about it, then I'm the crazy one, you know? And But that's not me. I was like, this is going to be the biggest uh, controversy in the history of the United States. 
there's a monopoly, they control everything. They read our emails, they read our location data, they, um, they sell it to intelligence agencies around the world, which is something I didn't realize at that point, but I came to a realization later. And so I realized that um, this was going to be a really big story. I started privately telling some uh, influencers within the entrepreneurial space and the VC space that this was, you know, warning them, you know, what do you think about this? And for the really smart people, they were instantly terrified in the same way that I was. If you know, the individual was, how do I say this, a little bit lower vibrational like thinking, they, they were like, oh, well, why isn't anyone complaining about it then? But for the really smart people, and I'm not gonna name names, but they're like, what the F, right? Like they were instantly terrified of this thing. They knew the exact ramifications of what this thing was going to be. My personal breaking point came and by breaking point, I mean that I realized that I couldn't be silent, that no matter what the cost, I had to expose this to the public, came when I caught Google deleting words out of their Arabic translation dictionary in order to make a Trump tweet sound crazy. Wait, so we're talking about confefe then? We're talking about confefe. Confefe was a word until the New York Times ran a hit piece on June 1st 2017 that said that this word was complete nonsense. Why did they say it was complete nonsense? Because Trump, a day before, tweeted out the following. Despite the negative constant press cafefe. And Google Translate translated this to, we will stand up. Which is the Arabic translation, right? That's what's claimed, though, there's other scholars that have said that it was a pre, it was an antediluvian term, which means pre-flood, and that it was something that the sons of Noah said to the very corrupt people that had, I guess, ruled the world. This is like this before the flood. So apparently there was a group of people that had a grip on a large section of the world, and they would say the words kafefe to those that were fallen. And then the flood came and wiped out a lot of these civilizations. Um, wow, I haven't heard that so, yet. That is awesome. So Kafefe was basically like a, a pre-flood FU, if you will, <laughs> to the elite. Yeah, I'm going to steal that. That's a great. It was a big FU. Trump tweets that on May 31st, 2017, after he gets back from Saudi Arabia, okay? And then the New York Times a day later is like, yeah, a bunch of people incorrectly have determined that this word means something, but it's actually nonsense. And we have a person that is blah, blah, blah from some like ivory tower, I think it was Harvard, that was an expert in this and says, no, this word doesn't mean anything. Now, when I did my research on this supposed expert, it turns out that he was a correspondent, a paid correspondent to the New York Times previously. So they're literally asking one of their contractors to confirm a story that they are assuming is true, right? So, um, yeah. And then we, and then we get branded as fake news. Yeah. <laughs> but it gets worse because Google took this word or I'm sorry, took this article by the New York times. One of their AI executives wrote a design document that said, in essence, we need to get rid of this word because obviously it's, it's meaningless and people are having this mistaken idea that it actually means something. So they designed a document to delete the word. And what's, here's the cherry on the top. The group that was responsible for censoring this word off of the internet called themselves the Derrida team. Now, some of you out there may recognize that and say, wait a minute, is that named after the French philosopher Jacques Derrida who advocated for the destruction of Western civilization through the manipulation of language. And my answer to that is maybe, right? Like it's a strange coincidence that they're naming their censorship team after the philosopher that advocated for it in order to destroy Western civilization. Um, he also founded cultural Marxism and postmodernism, him and, and this guy named Adorno. They're all, co they're all commies. Dude, it's yeah, crazy. Adorno. The more you yeah. get down into this research, you find out, yes, there's actually like, a um like you know they're, they're actually like adhere to this idea of socialism you know communism 
uh, the elimination of all classes and, uh, and then the hiding of information when that ends up murdering millions upon millions of people. Like, yeah. it murdered 30 million people in Russia after World War II. And uh, this class division ended up destroying like 70 million lives in the Chinese cultural revolution that was founded after this Marxist ideology. So these, these yeah. philosophers are very much in line. They're, they're like Marxian right, in their thinking. And so they kind of like spawn from this branch of we need to like overturn, you know, Christendom and the capitalist society and in order to bring a one world government utopia called internationalism which is crazy because like we you know we did a whole series on communism and in our second episode we basically showed everyone how the um the doctrine of adam weissapt and the doctrine of karl marx were basically one and the same that they were yeah. pushing the same thing and the history goes back to the first bavarian illuminati which then ends up being the blueprint for what is now uh, the you know modern day brainwashing apparatus, which is socialism and communism. Well, yeah, and then on top of that, then you have eugenics that falls in right into the whole like the deep state yeah. apparatus, the the whole plan of the deep state, right? And so, and that's another thing everyone's bringing up. I mean, this this can go multiple directions, but. You know, it's like the, we did a whole episode also exposing all of this in the drug epidemic. And what we were realizing is that, you know, because a lot of the questions, because uh, I used to work in the media and um, a lot of the questions the police would always bring up are why, why is the drug dealers, why are the drug dealers killing their own users? Like this didn't make any sense to them. And this question was burning in my mind for months. And when we started doing the show and really researching research this, it really hit me. This is all about eugenics. They don't care. It's not about the money. It's like they want to get everybody addicted at a young age. They just kill off these people and eventually they form their one global government. And it's like we're just the slaves to the system. Well, and, and to clarify, it's it's not just about the money because yeah, well, yeah. money is a huge part of what they control. But then there there are even there but they are don't always, care. It's no. like, hey, if you die, somebody else is right there. That's going to start using drugs. And that's, it's like and it just gets rid of one less person on the planet. Yeah, that's the operation. And it's like we're now we're in this like the whole global warming thing, too. It's like all oh, the we you know, all these things are going on and people are are gonna die or everyone's like dying and we need to do all these different things and and you know it's like you start looking into who's really being vocal in the global warming situation or you know whatever global climate, climate change. change whatever word they're using now and it's like you know it's the same companies that are involved with a lot of the pollutions are the ones like you know you start looking at the like the Rockefellers and all these different other names that are sponsoring climate change but at the same time they're also controlling a lot of like you know oils and everything else that's behind the scenes with all of this so you know when you start really taking a step back and really looking at the world and seeing how everything is run and then seeing how the ai the algorithms google all this stuff kind of works together it's just like it's just mind-blowing you know and i think it's it's hard for people to accept but that's one of the reasons why we're doing our show is to break this stuff down and present it in a way where people can understand it and also well just to know. make weird like there's a lot of weird stuff out there and the mainstream media doesn't give it a shot so why not give it a shot put out research and let people do the research for themselves and come to their own conclusions why can't we have a conversation like that right well they don't want it because the thing is is that the only way that a consensus works is when everyone overwhelmingly agrees and everyone that disagrees with that is ostracized, demonized, and made to sound crazy. And this was um, proved in a psychology experiment in the 70s called the ASH experiment. And what they did was they had this experiment, it was run, and someone would volunteer with a bunch of other people. And they would go into the experiment and then the um, the instructor would then like paint two lines on the chalkboard and say which line is larger than the other. Now, almost every single person, actually every single person gave the wrong answer except for one. And as it turned out, the other volunteers were actually actors themselves. So there's 
there's actually one volunteer and all the other people that they think are also volunteers are actually actors. All the actors are giving the wrong answer. What do you think happens to the real person when it's his turn to give an answer? He also gives the wrong answer 66% of the time. Now here is the most important thing about this experiment. If one other person gives the correct answer before the volunteer is able to answer, the consensus effect collapses and the person now gives the correct answer most of the time. So what happens is that in order to have this phony consensus, you need to uh, vigilantly crush anyone that's giving the right answer or else the illusion is broken. And you see this pattern, once you recognize this pattern, you start searching for the dissenters in every single thing that the media says, right? Like, oh, global warming is gonna like kill everyone, right? Like, okay, well, what do the dissenters say? Oh, it turns out the dissenters make more sense than the people on TV. But wait a minute, why aren't the t people on TV talking about what the dissenters are talking? Well, because they're pushing an agenda and they're only selecting people that agree with their agenda. And, um, and if you don't agree, then you're ostracized, you're demonized, and then sometimes you're even murdered. The Las Vegas attacks, um, people reporting that there were multiple shooters at the attacks. Um, and then surprisingly, what I found was there was an entry that didn't belong there. And this, okay, ready for your, for your crazy conspiracy hats to get on? Yeah. What I found was that